Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you some of the top stories from around the world. Let's take a look at today's headlines. Vaccine maker BioNTech to construct mRNA factories in Africa. Sudan's revolutionary forces demand complete civilian rule. Cuba rejects US interference after new evidence in right-wing 15N March. And Howard University student workers go on strike for a fair contract. In our first story, German company BioNTech has signed an agreement to open Africa's first mRNA vaccine manufacturing plant. It will partner with Rwandan government and Senegal's Institut Pasteur de Dakar. Construction will begin in 2022 with an annual production capacity of 50 million doses. Production capacity will be gradually expanded beyond COVID-19 to include vaccines for malaria and tuberculosis. According to the United Nations, African countries import 95% of their pharmaceutical and medicinal products. As of now, South Africa, Egypt, Tunisia, Ethiopia, and Senegal have varying production capabilities. Africa has received 128 million vaccine doses through COVAX so far. Only 5% of the population has been fully vaccinated. Recent reports have also shown that per capita vaccine supplies to the G20 countries has been 15 times higher than those to sub-Saharan Africa. The mRNA molecule for the COVID-19 is currently only being produced in the United States and Europe. BioNTech will install a containerized manufacturing unit in Rwanda. Moreover, the company has stated that it will transfer technical know-how and ownership of the site to local partners. Details regarding key issues such as regional regulatory frameworks and start of the production are still not known. In our next story, work stoppages, road blockades and protests against the military are continuing in Sudan. Workers across key sectors including healthcare, banking and oil have declared strikes. As of October 27, 10 protesters had been killed and over 140 have been injured by soldiers. Sudan's revolutionary forces have stated that the uprising will continue until a full civilian government is established. The Sudanese Professionals Association has also stated that a return to the civilian military transitional government will not be enough to end the mass protests. The body was a result of the compromises struck by the center and right forces after June 3rd massacre. The government would rule for a three-year interim period until elections in 2023. The Sovereignty Council, which was headed by General Burhan, was the highest body of the state. Burhan staged the coup just before he was supposed to hand over leadership to a civilian in November. He has stated that he will replace the civilian leaders with a technocratic government. Sudan has witnessed repeated protests against the dominance of the military in the government. People are still raising the slogan, down with the bloodshed partnership. Meanwhile, Buran is facing increasing international pressure. The United States and the World Bank have frozen a combined total of nearly $4 billion in foreign aid. The African Union has also suspended Sudan's membership on October 27. Meanwhile, Buran has dismissed six of Sudan's ambassadors, including those to China, the US, Qatar and the European Union. In our next story, the National Assembly of People's Power of Cuba has reiterated the demand for an end to the United States blockade. The body also noted the United States' role in instigating, organizing and financing terrorist attacks against Cuba. According to the Cuba Money Project, the U.S. Agency for International Development, or the USAID, has spent over $6 million on subversive projects against Cuba. New evidence has also been uncovered about a supposed citizen march against violence on November 15th. The Cuban government had already denied permission to hold the march. An official of the Communist Party of Cuba presented a leaked recording of one of the march organizers, Junior Garcia, on October 26. In it, he was talking to Ramon Sol Sanchez, who is based in Miami in the United States. 
Sanchez is affiliated with terrorist groups responsible for over 90 attacks on Cuban facilities. He could be heard offering logistical support for the march and coverage in U.S. media. The march also received support from U.S. lawmakers and U.S. funded groups. A top U.S. official also threatened fresh sanctions if the organizers of the march were prosecuted. These would accompany the 243 unilateral coercive measures and 60-year blockade already imposed on Cuba. And finally, we look at the ongoing strike by 2,000 workers at Harvard University in the United States. The Harvard Graduate Students' Union began the three-day strike action on October 27. Among the demands raised is fair pay and third-party arbitration for harassment and discrimination complaints. Other issues include health care coverage and a union security clause. The strike action was approved with a majority of 91.7% at the end of September. The union is demanding a salary increase of 5.75%, 4.5% and 3% in a three-year agreement. It has also called for a $21 an hour minimum wage for hourly student workers. This would be accompanied by a 50 cent increase in the next two years. Meanwhile, in the latest contract offer, Harvard offered a 3.5% pay increase in the first year. However, given the rate of inflation is around 5%, the union argued that this would still be a pay cut. Harvard has claimed financial distress due to COVID-19 as a way out of offering more substantial increases. However, while the university already has the world's largest college fund, its endowment increased by another $53 billion during the pandemic. It also reported a surplus operating budget of $283 million. That's all in today's episode of the International Daily Roundup. Visit our website on www peoplesdispatch.org for more details and stories and follow us on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you.